This episode of Fearless Rebel Radio is brought to you by You On Fire. You On Fire is the amazing 12-week online group coaching program that I run where we build up your worth from the ground up so that it's no longer hinging on the way that you look. It's got personalized coaching from me and incredible community support plus lifetime access. Get details on what's included in this program and sign up to be notified when doors open for the next cycle by going to some com forward slash you on fire. I would love to have you in that program and in that group. This is Fearless Rebel Radio, a podcast about body positivity, self-worth, anti-dieting, and feminism. I am your host, Summer Inanin, a professionally trained coach specializing in body image, self-worth, and confidence, and the best-selling author of Body Image Remix. If you're ready to break free of societal standards and stop living behind the number on your scale, then you have come to the right place. Welcome to the show. This is episode 148, and this is the season five premiere of Fearless Rebel Radio. I'm answering your questions about motherhood and talking about my experience with motherhood motherhood, and talking about what I'm looking forward to about returning and what you can expect from this season of the show. You can find all the links and resources mentioned in this episode at summerinanin.com forward slash 148. And you know, I don't think it would be a podcast if I didn't have some kind of construction noise in the background because (laughs) there's perpetual construction where I live for some reason. Before we begin, I have two announcements. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to this show via iTunes or whatever platform you use to listen. And if you haven't already done so, do me and my child a favor and leave a review for the show. (laughs) Leaving a review helps others to find the show and the information that you're learning here. In other words, you're contributing to the revolution to end diet culture by leaving a review. You can do that by heading to iTunes, searching for Fearless Rebel Radio, then click ratings and reviews and click to leave a review or give it a rating. Like this amazing one from Love to Ski Canada, which honestly, I can't remember if I've read this one before. So if I have, then uh, it's getting shouted out twice. Love to Ski Canada because they're Canadian. Summer, you and your podcast rock. I love the way you approach interviews with humor, humility, and genuine caring. Thank you for the amazing work that you do. I track all the reviews so that I can read them, and this one was like the one that was noted that I hadn't read yet, but I feel like I maybe had. Anyways, thank you, Love to Ski Canada. Second, you can get the free 10-day body confidence makeover at summerinandin.com forward slash freebies with 10 steps to take right now to feel better in your body, or just go to thebodyimagecoach.com and you'll find all of that there. To start this episode, I just want to say thank you. I have been off work for a year. Uh, I haven't recorded anything for a year. And that was really terrifying to walk away from that and to leave things for such a long period of time. I really didn't know what I was going to come back to. I still don't. I'm still kind of terrified. But I know that people have been downloading the podcast Uh, You've been liking my posts, you've been sharing them, you've been commenting on them. The ones that were all uh, slotted to just rerun while I was gone. All the stuff now is, is new, of course, but prior to that, they were all reruns. And I just want to say thank you. That meant the world to me. Thank you for still being here if you're listening right now, for subscribing, for leaving reviews. Like It just really, really uh, made me feel so grateful to be continuing to do this work and for having you as as a listener and a a quote-unquote fan uh, one of my biggest fears before I I went on maternity leave was that I was just going to become irrelevant and that no one would be here when I get back and that I'd be starting from zero to get going again and maybe I am I don't really know maybe no one's listening to this but I feel a little better (laughs) in that uh, you know there's still been some interaction and people reaching out and people messaging me in the interim And I know that that's mostly just fear talking because I don't know if you remember uh, the last episode that aired probably in the beginning of April, which was when I replayed the interview I did with Tara Moore. But I I believe I said I was planning on returning after six months, which would have been April. But then I had the baby and shit got really real. And I didn't realize 
the impact that the emotional and physical labor of motherhood combined with sleep deprivation would have on my brain, which I will talk about later. And also just how much I, I really just wanted to spend uh, as much time as possible as I could with the baby. And I was able to make it work. My husband really encouraged me to do that. Every other mom that I hung out with had a 12 to 18 months of maternity leave. So, you know, it was just really nice to have the summer with him and spend time with other moms that I've befriended uh, through this process. And, uh, and so I really was lucky to be able to take that extra time, even though perhaps I've, you know, sacrificed some components of the business in the interim, hopefully not. But I also just wasn't my best self after six months at all. I just really couldn't imagine working with clients or, you know, showing up and being my full self or writing a blog post or producing a podcast. I just really didn't have it in me. And so I'm glad I gave myself that buffer and that time. And it wasn't until around June when he was, I guess, I, that would make him, you know, pretty close to eight months old that I started to feel that itch again and that urge. And like, I had some things to say. And so, uh, I, I took the time to find a really good caregiver for, for Dylan and uh, still really wanted to have the summer with him because the summers here are so fun. We got to go to the parks and the beach and everything like that. And, uh, and plan to return in September, which is now. So I feel really lucky that I had that time and thank you for being here and I'm back now and I'm grateful that you're still listening. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to take this first episode to just say, Hey, share some of my experiences and talk about what I'm excited about for the future season and my work and everything else. And to answer your questions about motherhood in general, to potentially help someone who's going through a similar experience or that you could pass along to a new mom that you know, or if you have a friend that's a new mom, then this will give you maybe a greater perspective of some of the stuff that they're, they're going through. And so I asked you in my Instagram stories, which I feel like I'm a lot more active in now. So if you don't watch my stories, because they were dead for months and months and months, uh, check them out and you'll see lots of stuff that I'm talking about, lots of stuff that I'm working through and thinking and all that stuff much more personal, I would say, because I just have less time to censor myself. <laughs> so I have less time to be self-conscious. So I just say, I just post stuff without really like overanalyzing it, which is probably what I used to do. Uh, so I feel a little weird interviewing myself, but I did ask you for these questions and I compiled a couple of them together just because they were the same. And I was actually really grateful that so many people had questions for me. So I'm going to be interviewing myself and we'll see if that's weird, but we'll give it a whirl. All right. I'll start by talking a little bit overall about my experience with motherhood. The first few months were so hard. I had horrible sleep anxiety and insomnia and breastfeeding challenges. And I just would wake up most days and wonder if I was actually going to live to the end of the day because I was so tired. Um, I've, I've always been a terrible sleeper. I have a really hard time falling asleep. If I wake up in the night to go to the bathroom or something, I have a really, really, really hard time falling asleep. So to wake up with a baby in the night multiple times, I found it almost impossible to fall back asleep. And so that took a major toll on me and it gave me a lot of anxiety. So bedtime had this horrible feeling associated with it. And some nights I'd be awake from like midnight to five in the morning while the baby was sleeping and I would just be there like having terrible anxiety. And so that was really, really challenging. It was really awful. And I got some help for it uh, from my doctor and was finally able to take some stuff that helped a ton that I was able to do while breastfeeding because that was the main concern was that I couldn't take sleeping pills, uh, because of breastfeeding, but I was able to take, uh, some, this like antihistamine that has a really strong side effect of sleep that was safe with breastfeeding. Uh, and so once I had that, it really eased my anxiety and I was able to fall back asleep and I created a better routine around it. So after I would wake up to feed him, I would read a book for a bit before falling back, before trying to fall back asleep. But in any event, it was just so hard. And uh, I would say for the most part, like he was a pretty 
you know, average baby. You know, it wasn't like he was colicky or anything like that. He woke up, you know, a few times a night, which is totally normal. But uh, I would say we got pretty lucky in that, you know, he didn't have reflux. He didn't have colic. Some of the other challenges that other parents face, we we didn't have. Uh, it was really just me that was the problem and my ability to sleep. And I would have really loved to share more of my early months on social media, but I didn't, I just, I just didn't have the energy or the brain power to do so. And when I feel that way, I generally just isolate. I don't reach out. I don't feel like posting anything. Like I, I really isolate myself and just go really uh, private with the people that I'm close to in my life. And, uh, it, you know, it was the, by far the hardest few months of my life. And it went by so slow. Those first four months, like felt like four years, <laughs> But I was able to enjoy a lot of the time. So I know I'm making it sound really hard, but there was a lot of the time that I enjoyed. And then about uh, from about five, when he turned about five, six months, things got way easier. He started to sleep a lot better. I was only waking up one time a night. And that is when uh, I had a major turnaround and I was able to really enjoy our time together every day and get out and do stuff. Uh, but there was a lot of hard times the f and uh, I had family around the first six weeks, which was so important. I really don't know how I would have survived if I didn't have someone with me 24 hours a day for the first six weeks. So I had either my mom or my mother-in-law or my husband, and that was imperative. I really, really don't know how people do this on their own. I don't know how people go back to work after six weeks. I just don't, I don't, I just, I could never, I could have never done it. And so I feel really lucky to live in a country that offers a greater maternity leave, although that's not something that I had access to because I'm self-employed. It was just a choice that we were able to make because of our situation. Uh, the best thing I did was befriend some other moms to hang out with and sign up for some mom and baby classes. You know, having something to do each day with uh, Dylan and I was was the most important thing. And, uh, and that ended up being really great. I'm not the type of person to, you know, like make a lot of new friends and things like that. But I, I did, I forced myself to, it was like dating. I was like dating like five new moms at one point in time. I was like, okay, I'm seeing this mom on Monday, this mom on Tuesday. And, you know, I'd be in a class with, with another mom and I'd be like, Hey, like maybe we should hang out after class. And I really, really pushed myself to do that around three months when he was around three months. Uh, cause for the first three months, like I barely left the house except to go on walks with just him and I, um, I just couldn't get my shit together to do anything in public. Like I, I just felt like I was a disaster. I really felt like I was such a disaster. <laughs> um, so, uh, but having those mom friends was awesome and I'm still friends with them now. And, uh, it's been great because our babies have grown up, uh, together this past year. And I'll talk a little bit more about my experience threaded throughout these questions. So uh, someone asked, how did you feel about your birth experience and how did this change over time? So my birth plan, when my midwife said, Summer, what's your birth plan? I responded with drugs. My birth plan is drugs. It's an epidural. It's give me as many drugs as you can. I don't want to feel anything. <laughs> that was my birth plan. I just never had any illusions about doing this without drugs. I just wanted to get through it and give me all the drugs so I can get, get through it without feeling pain. That was my plan. And it didn't go that way at all. Dylan came really fast. He almost, I almost had him in the car. I, I honestly didn't think I was going to make it <laughs> into the hospital. I'll never forget it. Um, I went in, I started to have like, I don't know if it would have been early labor, or early active labor. I'm not sure. Anyways, I started to have some contractions at around like 3 PM the day that he would, the day before he was born. And, uh, and I kind of just knew I was like, okay, this is it. Even though I'd had the same contractions for a couple days leading up to it. I just, I don't know. I just knew like we went to the grocery store and the, and I told the woman that I was like, I'm having contractions. I think, you know, he's going to come tonight. And she's like, uh, you might have another week. And I was like, no, he's coming tonight. <laughs> And so I, but I tried to just ride it out because I thought maybe he's not going to come tonight. So I tried to, tried to sleep through it and uh, the contractions were about every 10 minutes. And then around uh, one in the morning, all of a sudden they were like two minutes apart, all of a sudden, just really intense, two minutes apart. And my midwife said to wait an hour just to see if it stayed like that. And so I think I waited 20 minutes and called her back and was like, no, like it's worse. 
like this baby's coming. And she said, well, why don't you just get in the bath? And that usually slows things down. And so I'm like, oh, okay. So I got in the bath and then 20 minutes later, I'm like, I, I'm going to push him out. Like he's coming out. <laughs> and so she said, get to the hospital. So we got to the hospital and I was just screaming, give me drugs, give me drugs. And I saw them look at each other and just shake their heads. Like there's no time. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> so anyways, they, they said, there's going to be some laughing gas for you up there. And, and I was like grabbing her arm, like, give me the drug. I want the epidural. And, uh, we made it to the room and I, and I'm, and I just, I hopped on the bed. I like ripped off all my clothes out on the bed. And I just said, I said, can I, can I push? And, and she was like, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. And she barely had time to get a glove on and he was out. He came out in three pushes, he came out super fast I was trying to inhale laughing gas, but I was doing it wrong. Like I was inhaling with my nose and then exhaling with my mouth into the tube that I was supposed to be inhaling <laughs> laughing gas with. So it wasn't very effective. I think I got a couple of hauls, but it, it didn't do anything. It didn't do anything. I felt everything. He was really small. So I was lucky or should I say my vagina was lucky. <laughs> I got out. I got out pretty lucky there. And I was really proud of myself for making it through. It, it's amazing the strength and courage you can find in yourself when you don't have a choice. And so the, the, they were asking me, the midwives were asking me afterwards, you know, are you okay with this? Like they, I guess they thought it could have been traumatic for me because I really wanted the drugs. And I, I actually kind of love the way it ended up happening. It wasn't what I wanted. It wasn't what I planned, but I love that it happened so spontaneously and so quickly. And he's clearly impatient like his mother. So he, he came out really fast and got it over with. He was born at 333. So that was also really cool. Three pushes and he was born at 333 in the morning. So that's my birth story. Uh, okay. Someone else asked, did any part of you mourn your pre-mom life in a way? Yes, absolutely. You mourn the freedom. You mourn the freedom to leave your house, to run an errand, to book a dentist appointment and we have no help here, so that made it really, really tough. We had help from family that flew in the first few weeks, but outside of that, it's just Mike and I trying to make this work, and not having that freedom is really tough. Specifically, my my group of friends, uh, we all turned 40 this year. I have a really close group of friends that live uh, across the country where I used to live, and I missed out on all their birthday celebrations. So they all had, you know, like weekend getaways or big nights out. And uh, I couldn't celebrate with them. And I cried a lot about that. Uh, that was really, really hard because if I didn't have a child, I probably would have flown back a couple times. Not all of them because I'm not Beyonce, but at least a couple times to celebrate. And, uh, and so that was, that was really tough. But I did a lot of living up until this point. So I didn't feel like I was missing out on too much. It's not like this was 10 years ago and we were still going out all the time and had friends that were going out. All of our friends have kids. Um, we were the odd ones out or the one not odd. There's nothing odd about not having kids, but we were the, the, you know, the black sheep, so to speak. And I was really ready for this. I was ready for the change. I was ready for the sacrifice. And I think that if I had been younger, not fully wanting this, I would have mourned more. Okay. I just recorded a massive chunk and it didn't actually record. So I have to redo it. Okay. So the question that I asked myself and answered already that I have to answer again is how has it changed your identity and marriage? So before uh, the baby came, my sister-in-law told us that having a baby takes a shit on your marriage. And you have to remember that you're both giving 110%, even though it doesn't feel that way. And I feel like that's accurate, 100% accurate. There is an adjustment in your relationship for sure. You know, both of you are making a lot of sacrifices and your intimacy can take a beating because you're just exhausted and, you know, you just you have your body is basically given to this baby. Um, they own it. <laughs> and you, when you have it to yourself, you don't, you don't want anyone else to touch it. You're just like, leave me alone. And so that's, you know, that's, that's a, that's an adjustment for sure. And, you know, the thing that really popped out to me was how much emotional labor and mental labor women carry. You know, you both may feel like you're doing an equal amount of work, quote unquote, like physical labor, but the woman, and I say woman in a very heteronormative stance, uh, in a very heteronormative perspective, because 
Um, it is like women who identify as women who really take the brunt of this, but we carry so much uh, of emotional and mental labor. Why do we have to think about the thank you cards? Like, what the fuck? Does anyone know a man who's written all the thank you cards? I'd actually be really curious. Um, we, you know, there's just a lot and, and we inherently take it on. And I think that to unpack all of it and to delegate it and to share in that, it just takes a lot of rewiring on both parts because as women, we've just been conditioned to take all that stuff on and we don't even realize it. You know, when you're thinking about when do we need to order diapers? What's he going to eat for dinner? Like all these different things that, that, you know, the woman generally thinks about, it's hard to to delegate it. And then the men aren't wired to think that way. And so it's, but it's like a complete, you, you both have to work really hard at it. And so we're still trying to work, work on that because, you know, I feel like I have to think a lot more about certain things than, than Mike does. And uh, I get frustrated and he's like, well, just tell me. And I'm like, I don't want to have to tell you. I want you to just think about it. I want you to just have it. Um, but you know, he, that's our culture. We were raised that way. We, you know, we've just been programmed to be that way. And so we both need to reprogram ourselves in terms of my identity. I don't think my core identity has changed that much. I think my values have maybe readjusted to prioritize family. And I think that I'm a little different on the outward. You know, I can talk to babies like I never thought I'd be able to. And I just give less fucks. I don't mince words. I'm just a lot more blunt and honest because I don't have time to hold stuff in. And that can be good and that can be bad sometimes. <laughs> so not having a filter is a little bit tricky sometimes, but um, that's also been really positive because you're just less self con You don't have time to be self-conscious. So you just blurt stuff out and it makes communication a lot easier. Um, oh, one other thing I just want to say about marriage is that you share this love for this baby that you've created and it's really amazing. And that can take your relationship to the next level. I would never suggest having a baby to like save your relationship, but it certainly takes your relationship to a different level because you share this love for this amazing thing that you've created. The next question is, how was your experience with motherhood different from your expectations and what surprised you the most? So let me just say that my expectations going into this, I thought it was just going to be the depths of hell for months and months on end. I think it's because I had spent the majority of my life not wanting kids that I had created this whole list of reasons never to have kids in my brain. And so I always focused on all the negatives and it was hard to detach from that. And I had to do a lot of work leading up to it to try and focus on some of the positives because I just thought it was just going to be so, so hard. And I couldn't see through like all these negative things, which sounds terrible now that I say it, but that was just the way that my brain had been wired to, to think about it. And so I thought, it was better than I thought it was. It was better than I thought it was going to be, which I think a lot of people say it was harder than they thought it was going to be. And in some ways, like the, the way that sleep deprivation feels is so much worse than you can even imagine. Cause you think to yourself like, Oh, I've had a night where I don't sleep at all and I'm okay. But you, you have to think about a compounding effect of that. And it's just, it, it just crushes you. Absolutely crushes you. Most people, at least some people can handle it. I'm can't. So I think it was in some ways a little bit easier than I thought it was going to be, but uh, the the positives were just way better than I thought they were going to be as well. And so that was amazing. The one thing that was different than I had wanted it to be was just, I really wanted to have that instant connection of love that people talk about, even though I thought maybe I wouldn't because I'd heard a lot of my friends say that they didn't. And I, and I didn't, you know, Dylan came out and he was on my chest and I was kind of like, what am I supposed to do with him? <laughs> like, what do we do? What do we do? Uh, and it took a while to feel that deep sense of love for him that keeps growing and growing. And I think that's normal, but there's such guilt associated with not feeling that right away. And even, even hearing myself say this now, I think, oh my God, I really hope he doesn't hear me say that later in life and think that I don't love him. And you just feel there's so much guilt and shame associated with it. But really, you have this new person in your life that you need to build a relationship with. You can feel attachment to them and you will feel attachment to them. And you'll feel like this natural sort of like caregiving tendency. But uh, you, you may not feel that deep sense of love. And that, that, I think it's OK. That's you're going to be OK. You will. It will come. It will come to you in slow little spurts in time. And then it just really, really overtakes you. And it's amazing. 
And so I didn't expect like how much I would enjoy being a mom, like how much I would enjoy singing songs and changing diapers and doing bath and all that stuff. Um, it's just, I loved it. And that's why I, I took an extended maternity leave. So it just surprised me how much I really, really loved it. The next question is what made me change my mind about wanting kids? And so if you've listened to this for a while or you know me, I spent the majority of my life not having a clock. It was never turned on and I didn't want kids. And so it's shocked me when I changed my mind. What happened was it was August. I remember it so clearly. I had I was about 37 and a half years old. It was August. It was the afternoon. I was folding laundry in the bedroom. And all of a sudden, this like feeling turned on in my body. And the voice said, I think we want a family. And I remember like looking around and being like, who the fuck just came in here and said that to me? <laughs> Get out of here. Get out of here now. And I I pushed it away because I was intellectually, I was like, nope, this is not the plan. This is not what we wanted. I pushed it away and pushed it away and I didn't even tell Mike for a month and he thought I was joking when I told him because he was so shocked by it and we gave ourselves a lot of time to process it. We had some other stuff that that was going on in our lives. We just didn't have time to really focus on it or make it a decision about it and so I saw some doctors wanted to see if it was even going to be possible and the results were pretty grim, you know, just all of my history and you know, the number of eggs that were left in my ovaries was very, very low for my age. And so, you know, we kind of just resigned ourselves to the fact that we thought we were probably going to have to do fertility treatments, but then we, we got super lucky. We got pregnant right away, like right away in the first month, um, which I know like a lot of people would just die for. Uh, so I feel super grateful for that. I think my ovaries just sent a Hail Mary down the fallopian tube. They were like, take this and don't change your mind. Uh, so we were we were extraordinarily lucky in that department. So nothing about my decision was intellectual. It was all like this weird internal, intuitive, emotional, like very woo woo thing that just kind of happened inside of me. So okay, the next question is: Do you have any tips about trusting your body while experiencing breastfeeding issues? I think I think that's what this person was asking. They they wrote tips in body trust while breastfeeding issues. So I believe that means like how can you trust your body when you're having issues with breastfeeding? And so the key to trusting our body is to trust that it's doing its best, even if it means that things aren't functioning 100% how we want it to, or what we would perceive to be right, which in the case of breastfeeding, we sort of have this perception that like, it's just going to be easy. This is what we're meant to do. And our, our breasts will, will, you know, have the right supply because you're in tune with your child. And, you know, so much of that is, is just like really unreasonable expectation that we put on ourselves. So I think trusting our body is just trusting that it's doing its best, even if it's not performing the way we want it to, which is, you know, it's the same key to having body trust if you are suffering from an illness or a chronic illness. And another huge component of trusting our body is just having compassion for it and treating for it, treating it with kindness. So it's not about trusting that like my body's going to be like completely healthy and do the things I want it to do. It's about trusting that like, we don't really have control, but we can be compassionate and treat it with kindness throughout, which can be hard when things aren't going to, going the way we want them to. I had so many issues with breastfeeding, so many moments where I was like frustrated and screaming and crying um, because I had chronic block ducts, which is not fun. I couldn't get a good latch. It was so messy. He had to have tongue tie and lip tie surgery. I cried a lot, felt like I was a failure. It was just like not there was nothing natural about it <laughs> the way, except for some reason, it just felt right. <laughs> it felt like I was like, this is what we're supposed to be doing. This feels right. Cause going into it, I thought, I don't know if I'm going to like breastfeeding. I don't like people touching my nipples. So, uh, but then it just felt right. Even though it felt like my nipples were going through a paper shredder for weeks on end, but it got so much better. And I think that to trust your body, you have to let go of this expectation of perfection and let things be as best as they're going to be and give yourself permission to opt out if it's just not working for you because you are half of the equation. And if you're not enjoying the process, if you are in tremendous pain and you know, you, you just don't feel like you can go on with it, like just stop. 
that's okay. That's trusting your body. Your body's sending you the message of like, maybe this isn't the best thing for us, for our mental health, for our physical well-being. Uh, you know, certainly you can tolerate some tough times. I think most people do with breastfeeding. But if you, you know, trusting your body is also trusting the signals that maybe it's just not the best thing for, for you and you or your baby and fed is best. The next question is, what are your tips for being gentle with yourself as a new mom and not trying to be perfect? So the quest to be the perfect mom can rob you of so much joy. Like what, I mean, what is the perfect mom? Like really, if you were to write it out, if you were to write out all the list of expectations that you have on yourself, uh, that you've put upon yourself, you, it'll probably help you see how ridiculous it is and how overwhelming it is. And once you write it out, you can just tear it up, <laughs> like just tear it up because it's, it's so silly. You know, it's like, oh, well, we have to make homemade food and we have to breastfeed and, um, you know, all this other crap. And depending on what like parenting philosophy you follow, like you have to do that right. And you know what, like think about the way that we were raised. I don't know how old you are, whoever's listening, but I was raised in the eighties and like, you know, we were in a room down the hall. <laughs> there was no monitor. Uh, most of us were like formula fed because breastfeeding, like for, doctors were like promoting formula as the way to go. You know, we, I, I don't even know if we rode in car seats. Like we, we did for a while, but certainly not once we hit like a certain age, we were like flying around the back seat of a station wagon. I'm not saying these things are safe but we all got out. Okay. <laughs> we all got out. Okay. And I think our parents weren't for a lot of us, our parents weren't raised with this idea of a perfect mom because that is really constructed so much from social media. I think there was probably a lot of that in like TV shows and magazines for sure. So I'm not saying there wasn't an influence there, but I think what happens now is that you have a peer group that can post pictures that you perceive as them being the perfect mom. And, tr- and like, I am susceptible, susceptible to this I see other moms who I'm like wow how do they have it so together like how can they write a Facebook post or an an Instagram post like I couldn't even like wipe myself properly in the bathroom you know like that it was really challenging for me I don't I don't know I just feel like I was such a disaster but you have to let go of those expectations and lower the bar for yourself like real low lower the bar to keeping both of you alive and keeping you and your baby alive is an achievement to be celebrated. Don't, and maybe just have the bare minimum of your self care. So like, okay, my ex, the expectation for myself is I need, I need to shower. Uh, for me, it was, I have to shower every day. I have to accumulate six hours of sleep somehow in like little one to two hour increments in the beginning. It's definitely not like that anymore. You know, the, these were kind of like my bare minimums. I have, to, I make, I make sure I have food. I need to be fed. I need to eat like a certain number of meals every day because breastfeeding makes you so hungry. Those were sort of the things that I needed. And as long as I was achieving those things, I, I had no other expectations on myself. And, and the baby was alive, obviously. So unfollow and spend less time with people who make you feel bad about yourself. Some, you know, social media is really manipulative. You can, you see a nanosecond of someone's life and then you fill in the rest of the picture with all of this stuff that you think is also perfect. And most, I don't think anyone, everyone's going through hard stuff. And I try and remind myself that when I do see people on social media and I think like, how do they have their shit together so much more than I did? Like, what is wrong with me? Find support with other moms who can, you can relate to and be honest with. So the, the mom friends that I dated and then befriended, did that part get deleted out that I said that? I can't remember. Anyways, I, I, I made a lot of mom friends. The, the, I, we would text each other daily, you know, like just, just stories, like, just like, Oh, Dylan just shit all over me. You know, like stuff like that, that, um, you could both laugh about together (laughs) or, you know, my nipples bleeding, (laughs) uh, that, that kind of stuff that you could just (laughs) relate to and know I'm not alone and neither of us have our shit together. Uh, so find people like that who you can be honest with and share your feelings. Just don't hold your feelings in because then you're just going to burst like a volcano at some point. And be really forgiving and compassionate with yourself and make time for yourself. As I said, identify the bare minimum of, of your self-care. So those, those are my tips for being gentle with yourself. As a, and that's just for you as a person, too. That's not even as a new mom. I think all of those things are still applicable um, to let go of perfection. 
Okay. So a friend of mine wrote, how is your vag? (laughs) And then another person wrote, how wrecked does the pelvic floor get? So I think it's important to discuss these things. I got lucky and I didn't have much damage, but I I really took care of my pelvic floor going into it. So I did a lot of pre-work for my pelvic floor. And the reason why I did that is because I read the book, The Fourth Trimester, which you've heard me mention in previous episodes as being so important to understanding what happens to your body and how to recover properly, which means six weeks of like complete rest after you have the baby. So I didn't do anything other than like go for short walks for six weeks. And then after that, I just still only walked and walked a little bit further, but I didn't step foot back into a gym until I was three months postpartum. And then I really approached things with kid gloves And I worked with an amazing pelvic floor physiotherapist, which I think every pregnant and postpartum person needs. You have to have a pelvic floor physiotherapist. And I know that that's a privilege. And I know that not everyone has access to that or or the resources to be able to afford that. Uh, But if you do, then it is, I would say it's so, so important. And I wish that more benefit plans or the government or health plans would cover that type of service because it's so imperative. You shouldn't have pain having intercourse after, uh, maybe immediately after that's normal, but you know, a few months down the line, like you, you shouldn't be peeing yourself. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't have pain during intercourse. Like those are all indications that your pelvic floor needed needs to heal more, needs to strengthen more. I think that a lot of those symptoms are normal. A lot of people experience them, but it's not just something that you just say like, oh, I had kids. So that's something that I experienced for the rest of my life. No, like there's ways that they can be healed. There's ways that you can strengthen your pelvic floor. I'm terrible at doing my pelvic floor homework now, but when I was doing it daily, it was, it was really strong. And it's not just about doing Kegels. It's more than that. There's specific ways that are suited to what you need. Like there's, you know, like I remember my left side was weaker than my right side. And so I had to like focus on like contracting the left. Side. Like it's just weird stuff that they have you do, but it works. And, uh, and so yeah, I'm a huge advocate of pelvic floor care and just normalizing some of this stuff too. And, and letting people know that like, just because you have a kid doesn't mean you suffer from incontinence for the rest of your life. Like you, you know, there's things that you can do to help, uh, heal. Okay. Did you experience difficulties with your body image and were you worried about how your body would react post-pregnancy? If so, how did you cope? Okay. I wasn't too concerned because I just knew that I had no control and that my body was going to do what it's going to do. I've worked really hard to get to a point to really surrender control of my weight. I don't have control of it. It's been proven to me over and over and over that I don't have control of it. And I truly just know I don't have control over it. My body was going to do what it was going to do. And so uh, that helped. And I think just not having any time to think about anything other than keeping us alive helped me to not think about my body as well. And I think as well, anytime I went in the bathroom, I usually had a baby in my arm and I was looking at him in the mirror. And I, sometimes I feel like I went days and days without even really seeing myself in the mirror. And I don't think that's necessarily positive, but it certainly helped me not fixate on my body because I was just so focused on this other human being. So I didn't fret about it as much as maybe I, I thought I would. And I was able to really focus on what it did for me and appreciate what it was doing for me. I I just feel so grateful. I feel very lucky that we were able to have a child and conceive and give birth. And I consider that such a miracle and it's made me a, a lot more grateful for my body and helped me to see it in a different way. Like it's just, it's given life to somebody else. And I think that if you can focus on those things, then you're going to be able to almost create a much deeper relationship with your body than you did before. And for sure, I've had some bad body moments. I talked about uh, in the podcast with Mara Glatzel, like I don't look at myself in the mirror and think like, I'm attractive. Like I just, I don't know, I'm not there yet. Like I, and I think that's just because I've been so focused on this, this other little human in my life. And maybe I don't spend enough time like, you know, putting on makeup or doing my hair, like things that might make me feel more confident, get it. I, I definitely need some new clothes. Like there's things that I can do to feel more quote unquote attractive, like just aesthetically, but it's not impacting my self-worth. Uh, the thing that impacted my self-worth I'll talk about in a, in a minute. 
But I did have some like really strong, bad body moments, but it was always when I was overwhelmed or worried about other things. Uh, it was, you know, it major bad body moments right before I returned to work when I was worried about, you know, what, what Dylan was going to be like when he was at his caregiver's house, like all this stuff that I was super uh, anxious about and just some other things going on in, in my family life that uh, were really worrying me. I definitely had a period of time where it was being then projected onto my body, but I've done this work for so long that I know that like when I'm having these bad body moments, it's an indication that there's some other stuff going on and I need to dig deeper. And so I was able to work through those. And so coming back to some of the basics was really helpful. There was a period of time where like I I wasn't like looking at other bodies on Instagram because I just wasn't checking my Instagram account that much. Coming back to that was really important. Coming back to some of the basics, some of the basics that I teach and that I preach, I had to come back to for myself. So, you know, making sure I had clothes that fit and make me feel good. And I certainly need some more for fall this year, but I got some for the summertime. It got me through, you know, looking at other bodies on on Instagram, uh, you know, sharing my feelings, working through moments of shame, like really trying to strengthen my voice of compassion, because I think that my inner critic got a really loud postpartum. And I'll talk about what my inner critics focus was on postpartum in a second. So I, you know, I, I did experience comparison to new moms and things like that. And so I definitely had some bad body moments, but it wasn't, I wasn't fixated on it a ton. And, and it was just like these moments that I had to work through. So next question is, how did you prepare yourself for the body changes that come after pregnancy? So again, coming back to some of the basics, follow a lot of Instagram accounts that are that feature postpartum bodies. And I can link to that in the show notes. Or if you check out, I have a blog post called Bot, like about uh, 10 ways to improve your body image during pregnancy. And I list all the accounts there as well. But I'll link to them in the show notes for this episode, which is at summerinandin.com forward slash 148. I wore maternity and stretchy clothes for weeks and weeks after. I didn't even attempt to try on my jeans or anything like that. I think I went through the whole winter. Like I went months, like six months postpartum without trying on jeans. Like I don't, I just wore stretchy pants. And then when the time came, I bought some new clothes that fit my current body. Like when my body kind of kind of just like level leveled out. Cause it does some weird, it did some weird like up and down stuff in the beginning. And I just tried not to expect anything. I really let my body do what it was going to do. And I, I, as I said before, I think I was just too exhausted to really focus on it. I, d- I really didn't look in a mirror. I don't have a full length mirror. The only mirrors in our house are in the bathroom and it's from my waist up. And so, you know, most of the time I was in there, I was holding a baby. And, and so my, my attention was on him and not on my body. So somebody asked, what's something no one talks about that might surprise someone about pregnancy or birth? And I think this is going to lead into just me quickly talking about the my inner critic and the hit that it took on my self-worth the impact that it has on your brain or at least my brain so people talk about baby brain and things like that and you know you think like oh it's just the the mom who forgets to pack a diaper this was so much more significant I was unable to problem solve I was forgetful I was unable to write I was I was just able to string together short (laughs) <laughs> four four word sentences that's what it felt like at least and that took a huge hit on my sense of self-worth one of my inner critics greatest weapons is to make me afraid of people judging my intelligence and so that really fired up my inner critic just making me feel like I needed to hide or I couldn't communicate it's why I was so dark on social media for so long because I was just afraid to write anything uh, or and I, and I couldn't, I really couldn't. I just, you know, I, I just zone out and watch the worst television show ever. And that would, that that's all I could really do when I had time away from the, the baby. I was just so forgetful and it took a huge hit. And that was months, months in uh, of that. It wasn't until like, as I said, June that I, he, he was around eight months old, uh, which is around the time that he was like sleeping through the night that I was able to start to use my brain again and then it slowly started to turn on a little bit more and I would get sparks of like oh that's a that's a good thought or like oh I could write that or that's something I want to talk about Uh, but that took uh, a while and so that took a huge hit on my sense of self-worth and so even though I said that you know I was giving less fucks and I was less self-conscious at the same time I was really self-conscious about 
my level of intelligence and my ability to return to work. And so that was so much more than the body stuff for me, which it always is. It's always more than the body stuff for everyone. And I think that that surprise somebody that might surprise somebody else too. And uh, other people can maybe manage it better. That's my perception. My perception, which is probably my inner critic talking is that everyone else has it together with that. And that was just me that I took such a huge hit on my brain. So I think that that's my inner critic talking. And I'm trying to work through that. But hopefully someone else can relate to that and maybe maybe share that they had such a huge impact on their brain too. Okay, so those are all the questions. Thank you so much for asking them. It feels a little narcissistic to talk about myself for this long, but I hope that that helps somebody or at least gives you some insight into my life for the past year. And if you know a new mom that might benefit from hearing that, then share it with them. So I'm looking forward to just being back, talking to adults, having some time to do something that uh, makes me feel alive. Not that like being with Dylan doesn't make me feel alive. It makes me feel really alive, but just in in a different way. It's been really interesting to be offline and out of the body positive and anti diet bubble for almost a year. I feel like it's given me a fresh perspective on things and helped me come back to why I wanted to do this work in the first place. So I've spent a lot of time talking and hanging out with other new moms in person and online. And it's taught me a couple of things, you know, diet culture is so much a part of our lives and there's so much fat phobia out there. And I really fear for our next generation, unless we start to educate people and do better for our kids and people don't realize that there is another option. When I explain my work to someone who doesn't know me at all, they they're like, whoa, (laughs) like that's another option. People don't know that you don't have to diet. They don't know that there's another option other than believing that thinner is better or that there is a life outside of wanting to be thin. And if they do, if they, that it blows their mind, first of all, when I mention it, and then they have no idea where to start or what to change. And I think that it's brought me back to my roots of why I wanted to have this platform in the first place, have this podcast and do the work that I do. When you're immersed in body positivity, you can forget that people don't know what intuitive eating is or that the majority of people still have a scale in their bathroom. You know, the people's houses I've been to, there's a scale in the bathroom and I want those people to get rid of those scales. And so a lot of people need the basics and they need to know these fundamentals. And so I definitely want to weave some of that into this season of the show and some of the resources that I provide for people who may be newer to this, because in order to get change, like we don't need people who are really radical on this to become more radical. Although like, I think that that's cool too, but we need more people to just be like educated on this and learn about fat phobia and learn how to fight weight stigma and learn about all the different ways that oppression takes hold in people's lives and things like that. Um, So for the first few months of this podcast, I'm going to be releasing bi-weekly episodes. I can't keep up with a weekly release based on just the childcare hours, but bi-weekly is what it's going to be. I have some awesome guests lined up. I have a list of like dream guests that I want for this season of the the podcast. And if there's anyone that you want me to interview for the show, definitely just message me and let me know. Uh, I'd love to hear about it. So I'm super excited about what this season holds and, uh, you know, just having less time to mince my words and be a perfectionist with my work. It'll be interesting to see how that all unfolds as well. I quickly want to mention just some ways that you can work with me. I am taking clients again. My focus is really on running you on fire right now, which is the 12 week online program that gives you a step-by-step way of building up your self-worth beyond your gene size. So you can break out of the diet culture cage, get free from body shame and live your fiery free untamed life. That is set to start mid-October, and I will have a specific date for that really soon. Uh, So if you are interested in working with me in that program, which is amazing, I love it so much, uh, then definitely go to summerinandin.com forward slash you on fire. Or you can always just go to thebodyimagecoach.com. That takes you to my website, and you can see my programs there. Um, But you on fire is... 
about learning how to stop hating your body so you can make mental space for things that truly make you feel alive, that fire you up, that give you a sense of passion and purpose. It is to help you liberate yourself from culturally imposed temptations to diet and be thinner so that you can feel complete and worthy no matter your size. We learn to tame that all or nothing perfectionist control freak voice in your head that makes you feel less than and let go of comparisons and the fear of what other people are thinking so that you can just be unapologetic unapologetically you and figure out who you are and what makes you so incredible. It's really amazing. I'm connecting with some of the alumni from the program now, and it's just so cool to hear what people are up to like years later and just the things that they're still applying in their life. And, uh, it's, it's awesome. It just gives you the tools that are going to last a lifetime, which is, you know, the tools that I use for myself through this whole postpartum time when I needed them. Uh, So if you're interested in that, it's going to start mid-October. You'll see some promotion around that towards the end of September, beginning of October. But you can get on the wait list uh, because there is a maximum number of people that I enroll for the program, and that's 30 people. And so go to summerinandin.com forward slash you on fire. And then if you're a coach or another wellness professional, I send out uh, monthly emails to you with coaching and business advice and stories of my experience as an entrepreneur and opportunities for mentorship. So if you're a coach and you're listening, um, you can get on a separate email list for that at summerinandin.com forward slash updates dash coaches. And so those are the biggest things that are happening right now, as well as this podcast. Thank you so much for being here. I'm super, super excited to be back and to have you listening again and reach out. Just let me know. What do you think of the podcast? Um, What do you want to hear this year? Who do you want me to interview? DM me on Instagram or Facebook, and I will definitely reply to each and every one of you. Uh, But thank you again so much for listening. It really means the world to me, and I'm so, so grateful. That is it for episode 148. You can find everything that I've mentioned here, all the links and the show notes at summerinandin.com forward slash 148. Rock on. I'm Summer Inanin, and I want to thank you for listening today. You can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Summer Inanin. If you haven't yet, go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this show. I would be so grateful. Until next time, rock on. Rock on.